Hey guys, Dr. Nick here, and I want to get you ready for the podcast you're about to be listening to. We had the pleasure of meeting this amazing cardiologist at a conference a number of years ago, and uh, he's such a personable guy. He just, he comes with so much enthusiasm and heart, and uh, he's got a lengthy, lengthy history of being in his field of expertise uh, of cardiology. He talks about uh, grounding, and he was on actually the the, uh, Earthing movie, uh, the documentary. And he talks about a lot of different things on this call uh, in regards to the use of statins, um, some perspective on heart health and what we're facing in the current immune crisis. And um, and obviously we talk a lot about grounding and some of his favorite tools like olive oil and CoQ10. And uh, when I when we first uh, met this gentleman, when Sonia and I were at the conference, uh, he was kind of he was blown away because he, he thought that I, I maybe looked a little bit like his son and he was just <laughs> he was in awe. And <clears throat> when you get a chance to hear this man speak, you can just feel his his love and his energy. And it's really infectious. And it's just wonderful to get a chance to be able to speak to someone with such uh, great authority on a topic and, and such an incredible history and to see how a man <clears throat> excuse me can operate uh, a practice and a teaching in this world uh, of a conventional model while bringing sort of the best of, of both worlds and really speaking to foods and he actually has a, a line of nutrients for for pets even so you're gonna you're gonna learn a ton about his perspective and uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the things that we hear whether it be from uh, you know, statin use uh, to, you know, blood pressure issues um, and even up to the, the chronic, you know, crisis that we're under with regards to our immune system, you can see just how important it is to get a really healthy functioning heart. And uh, and so, yeah, we're, I'm excited for you to listen to it. Uh, he's a wonderful man and it was such an honor to be able to speak to him. So I hope you enjoy it. Stay tuned and please let us know what you think of this conversation and maybe what your history has been with uh, in the world of cardiology. Uh, maybe you've been prescribed medication. Maybe um, maybe you've always wondered if there was a different way to look at heart health. And I think uh, this is a great conversation to open that dialogue. And uh, there's a lot more deeper dives to come in this area. But um, yeah, please let us know what you think and enjoy. Everyone, welcome back to another episode of Health Ignited. Uh, as you can see, I'm minus my wife today. She's off on a course. And so I get the pleasure of interviewing one of my favorite cardiologists. Um, I only know a few, so he's definitely up there. I know a few, obviously, just from, from teaching and being in conferences, but I've had the, the pleasure of meeting this gentleman. So his name is Dr. Steven Sinatra. And I'm going to read a little bit of his bio. He's a board certified cardiologist and assistant clinical professor of medicine at the University of Connecticut School of Medicine in Farmington, uh, Connecticut. He is certified as a bioenergetic psychotherapist and nutrition anti-aging specialist. He's the founder of uh, www.theheartmindinstitute.com, an informational website dedicated to promoting public awareness of integrative medicine, as well as vervana.com, where you can pick up some of those amazing sauces and spices and, and food-based products uh, for, for optimal health and health and wellness. He also has a, a side gig uh, at a, a website called agelesspaws.com, P-A-W-S, where he's helping to extend the life of animals uh, that are so important to us. Just a couple other lists here. He's board certified American uh, Board of Internal Medicine, American College of Cardiology, Fellow of American College of Cardiology, Certified Nutrition Special Specialist, American Board of Nutrition. Uh, the list goes on and on and on. And uh, he's been in practice for over 40 years. And I had the pleasure of meeting him in Boca Raton in Florida. And uh, we, we got a chance to talk. And uh, it, it turned out that maybe I, I had some sort of resemblance to his son. And we at the end of the conversation, he gave me one of his pasta sauces that we took home. And my wife, Sonia, and I couldn't wait to use and sure enough, it was, it, it literally felt like your tongue was almost dancing in your mouth because the flavors were so uh, amazing. So Dr. Sinatra, it's been uh, a long time coming. I've been wanting to talk to you for quite some time in person and, uh, or online, I guess, in this case. Uh, so thank you so much for being here today. Hey, Nick, thanks for, for the really nice and, you know, thought, you know, heartfelt introduction. That was really sweet. That was nice. Uh, absolutely. Well, I mean, coming from a cardiologist that, uh, you know, you're, you're speaking to that literal sense as well as the energetic one. 
Um, so, I mean, many people may have stumbled across the movie earthing.com and I would, I would love for people to, to get a sense of your viewpoint on heart health and cardiology, because I think it's, it's so interesting to see this, this world of medicine sort of merge into maybe more of these subtle fields, these electrical fields, and obviously the, the heart has, is all electric or mostly electric right. in its, in its nature. But tell, tell us, uh, just a little bit about how you came across uh, this understanding, this connection. You mean the uh, connection of grounding and CoQ10 and that they oh, share yeah. a similar relationship and all that stuff? You bet, you bet. Yeah, um, I mean, I've been using CoQ10 for, oh gosh, 40 years. I mean, uh, one of the first cases I ever used CoQ10 in was a young woman. She had postpartum cardiomyopathy, Nick. It's, it's just a, it's a dreadful disease. I've only seen it a couple of times in my lifetime. And believe me, I don't want to see it more than a couple of times because a young woman delivers a baby and the baby's fine, but the young woman goes into heart failure. Uh, and the theory behind it is, is that the, the neonate um, just draws all the nutrition out of the mother. And some of these mothers are susceptible. Fortunately, it's very rare. Uh, but when these mothers develop uh, heart failure after they develop a baby, it's, it's like a medical emergency. I mean, it's like, it's like awful. And um, um, so... I saw a woman and she had a two-year-old and basically she was very short of breath. She went from doctor to doctor and one of her doctors uh, told her about me and she ended up seeing me. And I put her on back in a day, that was about almost 40 years ago. I put her on just 10 milligrams of CoQ10 three times a day. And I asked her to see me in a week and she came back in a week and she said, doctor, I think I feel better. I said, really? I said, okay. So I doubled the dose and I said, see me in a week. And she came back and she says, I, I know I feel better because I'm not coughing all night long. I can sleep a few hours. I, you know, I, I, I get up to go to the bathroom. I urinate. Um, and when I looked at her, her peripheral edema was slightly less. And that was, that was kind of encouraging. Um, so I doubled the dose again. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, she went from 10 to 20 to 40 three times a day, which is a good dose of CoQ10 back then. And um, after the third week, she came in and said, I know I'm better. I can do the dishes. I can do the laundry. I can, I can take care of my two-year-old and, and my baby, blah, blah, blah. So she was already typed in cross for a heart transplant, by the way. And uh, uh, she was waiting for the call. And about six months after she, quote, improved, she got a call from the Medical College of Virginia. We found a heart for you. We have a, a heart. So then she calls me and says, what should I do? And I said, follow your intuition. I said, if it were me, I'd probably stay with my own heart. But you, 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 know, you just pray over it and see what happens. And she said, I'm going to stay with my own heart. And uh, that was like 40 years ago. And, and you know, she's had bumps in the road. She had a pacemaker. She had a defibrillator put in and stuff like that. But she's still in her like, mid-70s and thriving. You know? So, I mean, that's the good news. So, so basically, what is it about coenzyme Q10? That is remarkable. Well, you know, it's a potent electron donor. It, it, it supports the production of ATP. Uh, it thins the blood. I mean, uh, CoQ10 does everything right. And when I stumbled upon earthing and grounding uh, with Clint Ober 20 years ago, um, I realized that grounding was an incredible electron donor as well. And if you look at it, Nick, if, if you take CoQ10 internally, or if you ground, you know, you put your bare feet on Mother Earth and you take it in a Schumann resonance, which is really the ohm of the Earth, the humming of the Earth. It has, a, it has an electrical potential. It's 7.83 hertz. And um, uh, basically, if you take in that energy, um, it's like taking in, uh, you know, handfuls of antioxidants. It's, it's just amazing because grounding does so, so many things well, like taking in CoQ10. And I realized that they were both electron donors. And uh, in my, you know, I've, I've been in a doctor now uh, 50 years. In fact, my 50th reunion from Albany Medical College is, uh, oh gosh, it's like 11 months away. It's May of next year. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, I will have graduated medical school 50 years ago, next, well, next, next May. And, uh, you know, if I look at my greatest achievements, uh, I have to say it's my research on grounding and CoQ10 because they share, they literally do almost the same thing, but differently. You know, one is through uh, 
the absorption, you know, uh, through the mother earth and the other is taking and targeted nutritional supplements. So I'm, I'm blessed that these two discoveries were placed in my path. And, uh, I, I just feel that, uh, uh, both earthing and grounding and, and CoQ10, uh, help to save a, a lot of people, or at least give them a better quality of life. I mean, I'm sure about that. I mean, you can take that one to the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it means a lot coming from someone with the vast amount of research and history that you have and, you know, being in clinical practice. It's, it's another thing for people to hear this sort of, you know, from from, I don't know, maybe a friend, hey, you should get your feet on the ground. But when you're starting, can you help people understand a little bit more like what those electrons are doing inside the body? Like, why? Why does that matter? You know, is oh, that, great is that question. You know, a, a great question. I wrote a paper uh, about 10 or 11 years ago. And Nick, I've written, you know, maybe 50 peer reviewed white papers, maybe more. Uh, I've written over 20 books. And uh, when I discovered that placing your feet on mother earth actually thin the blood. In other words, you know, what we want is our blood to be like red wine. Uh, we don't want it to be like red ketchup. <laughs> if we have like red ketchup blood, it sticks, it clots. And if it clots in the brain, yeah. you have a stroke. If it clots in your heart, you have a heart attack. And, uh, you know, as a heart specialist in New England in Connecticut, I was privy to the Framingham study, which went on for decades, right? And the, and the organizers of the study were like pulling their hairs out because they realized that the people that were living the longest uh, had higher cholesterols. And, and if you look at it, this was the complete antithesis of what they believed. Oh my God, what is it about cholesterol that makes you live longer? That they had the opposite. They, they, were, they were privy to the opposite. And, um, you know, I was involved with that research being a New England cardiologist and stuff like that. And if you really look at, um, you know, some of the aspects of, you know, what gives people coronary disease, uh, you know, it's really inflammation. There's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, it's like, it's, I mean, I mean, inflammation causes red ketchup blood. Now, where do you get inflammation? Well, I mean, the, the most inflammatory compound you can put into your body is sugar, you know, white table sugar or sodas, which have, you know, like a can of cola has about, you know, 12, 12 to 15 teaspoons of sugar. You know, people put three to four teaspoons of sugar in their coffee or their tea. Um, they eat a lot of sugar. They eat a lot of sweets, blah, blah, blah. And what we realize it's, it's sugar. That's the enemy of setting up the, what we call endothelial cell dysfunction from an excessive insulin response to the sugar and basically insulin is the most pro-inflammatory hormone. So cardiology has become, it's like what's happened in society today. It's like everything is turned upside down with COVID-19, right? I mean, it's like crazy. I mean, you know, whether it's politics or medicine, it doesn't matter. Everything is like turned upside down. I mean, uh, you know, even, you know, even protection from the police. I mean, it's just unbelievable what's going on today, but like, it, it's just amazing that, you know, sugar, in my opinion, th there's no doubt about it. I mean, this is the origin of the inflammatory cascade in the body. And, uh, you know, we used to think it was cholesterol, but it's not cholesterol. It's, it, it's really sugar. Uh, sugar sets up the dynamic. And, it, and look, Nick, what has happened in the last like 50 years, 60 years? I mean, I grew up in a diabetic family. I mean, my grandmother was diabetic. My mother was diabetic. They both went blind from retinopathy. And I've always had a fear that I would go blind because remember all the mitochondrial DNA is carried by the mother's side. I mean, you know that as a, as a, as a, as a doc, you know? And like, I, I know that. And I'm saying to myself, well, geez, I mean, how can, am I, how can I protect myself, you know, going forward? And then, you know, being a Coke 10 guy, um, I come across literature it happened in last year, Nick, you know, I mean, CoQ10 has all this, all these cardiovascular supports. I mean, I mean, the, the literature is full of what CoQ10 does for the heart. Right. But there's also a lot of literature about the anti-aging aspects of CoQ10. In other words, it prevents Alzheimer's disease. It prevents Parkinson's disease. Um, uh, Down syndrome. There's amazing stuff with Down syndrome and, 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 and reversal with CoQ10. I mean, it's just incredible. But then when I read about glaucoma and retinopathy, 
being reversed by CoQ10, then I got it because, you know, I got two sisters and a brother. Um, and again, my mother and grandmother had severe retinopathy, both went blind, but yet all my sibs and myself have been taking CoQ10 for decades and we don't have any retinopathy, nor do we have any glaucoma. And I just recently, I mean, this is what I just learned about CoQ10 is that it helps to prevent, you know, degeneration of the eye. So, I mean, like, I'm always amazed about this in incredible nutrient. And again, it shares common ground with earthing and grounding because this electron donor capability, I think, is a secret sauce in preventing oxidative stress and uh, the ravages of aging. I, I think CoQ10 uh, and grounding are probably the best ways of delaying the ravages of aging. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm really bullish on that, and I experienced it in my own life as well. So, so the setup for chronic inflammation, you know, obviously there's a huge ideology with, with the sugar and, and modern, modern food and, you know, processed foods and things like that. Um, and so this, this setup of chronic inflammation, I, I'm imagining is leading to this chronic depletion in electron health in the body. Correct. So how do you, how do you tie those two together and, and what would it take to start to bring that, I mean, obviously you want to do it orally with the CoQ10, you want to get out and do some grounding, but how does that mechanism happen? And, and how do we sort of reverse that process in people that are stuck in chronic inflammation? Well, it's a great question. I mean, um, um, one of the things that a heart specialist brings to the table is we realize how important diet is. Um, I mean, I've, I've watched my diet all my life after I became a board certified cardiologist. And, and then when, when I became a a certified nutrition specialist. And I got to tell you, Nick, I studied for that examination for the American. I studied two years for that examination. I took it over 20 years ago. And uh, I studied hard for that. And uh, that was a tough exam. I got to tell you, um, it was a three hour exam. Uh, you know, uh, you know, it was a lot of multiple choice, uh, a lot of paragraphs where you had to read paragraphs and fill in the blanks and blah, blah, blah. But like when, when I became a certified nutrition specialist, I realized how important eating a proper diet is. Now, a lot of Americans don't realize how much genetically modified foods we eat. They, they don't understand that because it's sort of camouflaged. You know, a lot of Americans think canola oil is healthy. I mean, canola oil is good for machines. It's not good for your human body. I mean, I mean, I mean canola oil is a toxin in the body, you know? Mm -hmm. And like, um, you know, again, I mean, people just... I don't know where they learn this stuff, or uh, but we eat a horrific diet here in the United States. I mean, a lot of genetically modified foods, a lot of foods loaded with sugar. I mean, we got over 100 million diabetics in this country. Think about that, Nick. Yeah. I mean, like, what happened to create over 100 million diabetics in the USA? That means that one out of 3.4 people has either type one diabetes or type two diabetes or at least insulin resistance. And if you look at, and, and I just wrote this up in the textbook of cardiology, by the way, that's coming out in 2022. But if you look at um, the fast food industry, which started in the fifties, um, in the mid fifties, when I was about eight years old and in the mid fifties, um, I remember walking to my third grade class. Uh, there was no busing back then. Uh, you know, the environment was safe, so to speak. Uh, the kids weren't being kidnapped and there was no, you know, in other words, we walked. I mean, society was different. It was like eight years after World War II and blah, blah, blah. And uh, it was, a, you know, the USA was a safe place to live. And I used to walk to school, but I walked on leather shoes, hmm. on concrete sidewalks. And I was actually, you know, discharging my body of oxidative stress. What I know now about earthing and grounding and about leather soles but now what happened in the mid fifties? Well, the Adidas generation came in, the Nike generation came in in the sixties. Now the kids are walking on neoprene instead of leather. Uh, there's a lot of asphalt out there and sidewalks and highways, which is non-conductive to the earth because it's not a natural ingredient. Then what happened? Well, then we started busing kids to schools, right? In other words, kids weren't walking anymore. So we took away exercise and now kids are being driven. And then worse yet, a lot of the schools were suffering economic distress, so they were canceling, you know, football programs and gym programs and, and, you know, intramural sports and stuff like that. So it was like the perfect storm. What happened? Well, now we're walking disconnected from the earth. 
and we're eating a lot more sweets and sugar. Um, and basically, we set up the perfect storm for diabetes. And when, one, when the researchers in Poland showed that disconnected rats, you know, from the Earth's environment had higher blood sugars, hmm. and when Gaetan Chevalier showed this in unpublished data in a rat experiment in the United States, so there were two, you know, you know researchers in the USA and researchers in Western Europe were looking at this. What they found was that when you're ungrounded, mammalian rats had higher blood sugars. And I'm saying, whoa, wait a minute. Maybe that's one of the reasons why we have so many diabe diabetics in the country. Now, you know, not only are we eating more sugar and high fructose corn syrups and genetically modified foods and blah, blah, blah. Now we're, you know, walking ungrounded and basically we're rendering ourselves diabetic because all these, it's like the perfect storm. All these things come together. Less exercise, you know, um, uh, ungrounded, uh, eating more sugar, uh, you know, all this stuff comes like a perfect storm. And, you know, the United States, um, we got our fair share of diabetics in the country. And you know, the problem with diabetes is, Nick, the problem is, and th this worries me a lot, uh, again, because I come from a diabetic family. The average diabetic in, in th this day and age lives about 10 to 15 years less than the average non-diabetic. And that, you know, every year, you know, you know, the children are outliving grandparents and every year, you know, we're, we're living longer, but wait a minute. Now there's something that's stuck, you know, in this, in this marvelous way of longevity going up and up. Now we've reached a peak and I've, and I feel that our longevity in the USA is going to go down. And by the way, it has gone down. We lost a year, uh, even with the COVID situation, you know, the average Okinawan, or the average person living in the Mediterranean basin, I don't know if people know this or not, but they live an average of eight years longer than the average American. Wow. And we have the best technology in the world, but yet we're 35th in life expectancy. You know, it's just in the world. I mean, it's just incredible. We have all this money, all this technology, but yet we're dying, you know, uh, you know, we don't live as long as, as peoples from the Mediterranean basin, the island of Okinawa, Japan, et cetera. So, you know, we got to do something in America today. And, and it all starts with diet. It really does. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just picturing like these people that are, you know, starting to present with higher blood sugars and things like that. And often the first thing in the, in the cardiology movement, especially, you know, in the past has always been to look at cholesterol levels. So right. cholesterol levels are rising. Some people, you know, get put on the, the statin drugs or what have you. Um, and we know that there's now an impact on, on less effective or less efficient blood sugar regulation when on a statin medication. So, right. I mean, here, here's, an, here's another sort of modern advancement in our technology to use medicines for a very particular purpose, but then it has these other outcomes. So can you speak to, okay, now let's, we're, let's talk about cholesterol in this mixture of inflammation that you're referring to. Yeah, I mean, you, you nailed it, Nick. You absolutely nailed it. And your subscribers should be very grateful that you brought this up. Let me tell you something. What do we have? 40 million people in the United States taking statin medications, maybe more, closer to 50 million right now. And like we know from previous research, whether it's done in this country, whether it's done like the Jupiter study, for example, the Finnish study, you know, all these different studies uh, from, from all over the world has shown that statins, um, when people taking statins, um, blood sugars go up. In other words, people can become diabetic uh, while taking statin drugs. So now we've traded off two evils, right? <laughs> I mean, now, and, and, and the other evil is, is that a lot of people who uh, are diabetic from statins, now they're developing coronary calcification at the same time, and we don't want that. We don't want the coronary arteries to become calcified because then if, if the calcium breaks off and we get a plaque rupture, now we have a heart attack or a stroke and who needs that, right? So you nailed it. In other words, you said that even though there's 100 million diabetics in the country and you know there's a perfect storm of less exercise, more sugar, uh, ungroundedness, now you've thrown another monkey wrench into it. And now we got you know, you know, 15% of the population taking statin drugs which can render us, render higher blood sugars. So 
I'm glad you brought that up because again, it's it, it's the perfect storm. And like people see, as a heart specialist, you know, when it comes to statins, less is more. When it comes to any pharmaceutical medication, less is more. I mean, uh, you know, if we look at the fourth um, cause of death in America today, you know, heart disease is number one. Um, uh, cancer is number two. Um, basically, stroke is number three. Um, and then number four is properly prescribed drugs, properly prescribed. Uh, wow. And that's, that's unbelievable. You know, I mean, people don't realize that 20,000 people a year die just from taking aspirin from GI bleeding. I mean, people taking non-steroidals, you know, all these different non-steroidals uh, can get renal failure or, or hypertension uh, leading to renal failure. Uh, people taking analgesics, uh, you know, that are non-steroidals um, can get liver failure. I mean, there's so many unexplained cases of liver failure from taking over-the-counter, you know, headache medication. I mean, so, I mean, people got to realize that, look, as a heart specialist, I can tell you, <laughs> I'd have a lot of dead people if it wasn't for pharmaceuticals. I mean, I have used pharmaceuticals in, in uh, arrhythmias and heart attacks, and I've saved a lot of people with pharmaceuticals. So I'm not throwing pharmaceuticals under the bus. I'm just saying that we need to have less pharmaceuticals. Hey, look, Nick, if you've got a kid in status asthmaticus, who cares if they're on a pharmaceutical? We've got to save their life. We've got to open up their airways. We've got to get them to breathe. If we have an obstetrical emergency, we've got to give people, you know, pharmaceuticals. Let's face it. I mean, I mean, but, but you know, I'm not down on them. I'm just saying that there are healthier ways. You know, there are, there are ways where we can, you know, choose wisely where we don't get the side effects of, of pharmaceuticals. And, and like I said, when it comes to cholesterol, I, I just feel that uh, cholesterol is a necessary component of the body. I mean, even in this day and age of COVID, I mean, let's face it, vitamin D is one of the best ways of combating COVID. People don't know that. If you have a vitamin D level of, you know, 35 to 60 in your bloodstream, uh, and if you do catch COVID, most likely, maybe 99% of the time, you're not going to die from it because you're not going to get the horrific complications. I mean, they've shown that in the medical literature over and over again. Yeah. But- if your blood level is low, you know, even if you live in the South where, you know, you're putting on gobs of sunscreen, you're not absorbing the UV light, you know, you're not going outside, you're not getting enough vitamin D in your diet, and you have a vitamin D level of 15 to 20 in the blood, and you do catch COVID, yeah, yeah, you can get complicated, and it can kill you. There's no doubt about it. So, like, you know, I, I think that vitamin D is important. How do you make vitamin D? Well, the UV light from the sun comes down, Right. You got cholesterol in your skin. <laughs> the combination of UV light and cholesterol in your skin makes vitamin D3. Yeah. So why would you want to kill cholesterol in your body? It doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't make sense. And uh, when I see these people with low cholesterols and they say, oh, my cholesterol is 85, my LDL is 60, you know, a chill goes through my spine because they think they're doing a good thing. And uh, I, I just feel that you know, as a board certified cardiologist for 40 years now, I, I, I just feel that uh, the cholesterol story is way overplayed. Now, would I give a male a, a, a statin drug? Of course I would. Maybe five, 10 milligrams, maybe three, four times a week. I believe in low dose statins, you know, not for cholesterol lowering, Nick. I use low dose statins because they're incredible blood thinners. And like I said before, it's red ketchup blood that is killing us today. So statins do some good things. You know, they thin the blood and they're really powerful antioxidants, unbelievable antioxidants. Remember Nystatin for, for fungal disease? Remember we would give somebody Nystatin? Well, that's a statin. And, and statins have antimicrobial activity, antioxidant activity. And, and you know, the, the West of Scotland study, which showed these incredible smokers who are smoking, these young males smoking three, four packs a day, <laughs> Well, the ones on, on statins live longer, but, but even the research has said it had nothing to do with cholesterol. The research has said it had something to do with blood thinning and blood rheology, meaning that the statins, when the, when the red blood cells were going through the spleen, it was changing the shape of the red blood cells, making them more slippery. <laughs> Wow. That's why they got less stroke and heart attack. And even the research has said that had nothing to do with cholesterol. So look, low dose statins can do a lot of good things. 
and, and I do like them in men under the age of 75. I could, you know, I think under the age of 75 is still a young man. So like under the age of 75, um, I, I'll use a low dose statin. Why not know the 75? I worry about the side effects of statins interfering with memory. I do. And, and, and we need LDL for memory. LDL is needed for neurotransmission of impulses in the brain. So if you lower it too much, you know, I, and, you know, Alzheimer's and pre-Alzheimer's is a problem today, you know, especially in the older population. Let's, hey, by the way, even in the 50-year-olds, I mean, they're seeing it younger and younger. You know, a lot of it probably has to do with the EMF and, and the 5G and, you know, the low dose and maybe the stat. I mean, it's, it's the perfect storm. I, I think we're living in a perfect storm environment f- with a combination of, uh, you know, toxins, EMF, high blood sugars, pharmaceutical drugs, et cetera, et cetera, where it's changing, you know, our genetic structure, uh, leading to more uh, Ill- illness and pathology. Yeah. I love how you're speaking to this. And I've got so many points that I want to um, help. Uh, help the listeners understand. And I think one of the most important ones just on, on what you're just speaking to with regards to statins is that it's so it's, it's part of our complacence. I think as, as patients to go see the doctor, the doctor's not doing anything wrong. I don't think necessarily, you know, unless they're, they're being, you know, outright ignorant or, or not looking at the research or what have you, but your doctor wants you to eat a healthy diet, wants you to exercise, wants you to do all the right things. And maybe in the pathway to get there, the statin is going to play a role. And I love how you spoke to low dose statin use. And I think that there's a, a, an absolute role for people. The problem I, I always see with, with individuals is when they just take that and run with it and then they don't put any responsibility back on themselves to make those changes because in a perfect scenario, you're working with your doctor. You're, it's not that the doctor just prescribed you something and, you know, welcome to the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there is an education that's missing. And, and this is what you're filling that gap in that I so appreciate, especially with your enth- enthusiasm. I mean, it's, it's infectious to hear a cardiologist of plus 50 years, you know, teaching on these really important principles where people do have to take responsibility and you don't just rely on the medication and don't be mad at your doctor for recommending it because it's partly your fault, you know, and we all have to take responsibility, partly your fault for eating the way you were and, you know, and now getting information like this to take an active role, you know, get, get in doing some grounding, take some CoQ10, be proactive with your diet and preventive. So I, I love that you're, you're speaking Nick, to that. You, you brought up a good point. There's a lot of good doctors out there and they have good intentions, but the Achilles heel, even of the good doctor, is that he'll treat patients numbers instead of treating the patient. <laughs> in other words, they'll see higher numbers in their cholesterol and they fall into the trap, even though it's a healthy person, by treating the number instead of the patient. And then now they've fallen off the wayside. Instead of bringing you know, their healing capabilities to the table, they've fallen into the trap where they think lower is better. And in my experience as a heart specialist for you know, almost, well, four decades and a doctor for five decades, Remember, it takes five to seven years to become a heart specialist, you know, in your training. You know, it's not easy. But like um, the the best doctors out there, Nick, I can tell you this, are doctors, I think, in my age group, a lot of experience, gray hairs, you know, uh, (laughs) who are treating patients and not numbers. In other words, they're using their clinical experience. Uh, That's why, you know, Doctors shouldn't retire at age 65 today. They're, they're just too important right now. And, and you know, we, we need to rely on their clinical experience because there's nothing, there's no better teacher than when you do things over and over again and you're seeing positive results. Um, and, you know, that is really the essence of a good physician or a good healer is, is, is they, they develop this sixth sense of, 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 of healing people because they just intrinsically know what works. Mm, Love that. Um, I want to take what we've been talking about and integrate that into our current world with with COVID. And what we kind of talked about was this perfect storm. We talked about the exercise, the lack of grounding, the the sugar, the medications. Um, 
you know, and now we're in a situation where we have a cold that looks more like cardiovascular disease. What's in, in your cardiology perspective, what's, what's going on? Why is it hitting the cardiovascular system so aggressively? Well, you know, that's something that's sort of not new. Um, you know, it's um, something that I've dealt with all my life, Nick, really. Um, I can remember uh, when I became a cardiologist in the, in the mid 70s, where every time there was like a, a little influenza, you know, a regular flu-like epidemic that went across the country. As a heart specialist, uh, I was always involved in patients who were intubated as a result of the flu. In other words, a lot of these viral flus ended up producing a bacterial pneumonia because, you know, patients had chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, the viral pneumonia, precipitated the bacterial ammonia. We treat the patient with antibiotics, put them on ventilators, use positive and expiratory pressure, just like what they're doing now with, with uh, COVID. Mm -hmm. And um, over the years, I remember losing people on ventilators uh, because these viral prodones were just horrific and, and people would go into heart failure. And um, I saw many cases of myocarditis. So when any influenza illness attacks the lung. Well, where's the heart? Well, the heart's between right, both lungs, right? It's in the center of the chest. It's in the mediastinum. And basically, um, I, I saw lots of influenza cases where we saved a lot, uh, you know, on ventilators and stuff like that, but we lost people too. So in this day and age with COVID, what's really happening is that the virus, um, it locks into the ACE2 receptor uh, in the lung, uh, but there's ACE2 receptors in the heart as well. So the COVID-19 can attack the heart and, you know, worldwide, whether it's Wuhan, China or Italy or Spain or the USA, there's lots of cases of myocarditis. In other words, you know, the, um, the virus attacks not only um, pulmonary tissue, lung tissue, but also cardiac tissue as well. And um, this is an important fact to consider because some of these people who recover from COVID-19, they have dreadful fatigue and shortness of breath and a lot of it is due to cardiac decompensation. Now, there's good news. You know, a lot of these people heal. The, 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 one, one thing about the heart, it's a remarkable organ. It's, you know, the heart, the brain, and the reproductive organs are the most intricate. They're the most specialized. Um, uh, they're the most prone to oxidative stress from EMF. But when they get sick, because they're so intricate, they can recover quickly. Um, especially if you give them raw materials. And, and what I found that, you know, giving people magnesium and ribose and CoQ10 and carnitine, you know, giving them the awesome foursome, I would call it, um, you know, in, even in people with viral pneumonias or myocarditis, uh, it's just, you know, help these people. Um, one of the things about CoQ10, Nick, that I've learned about over the years is that, uh, it's, it attacks inflammatory mediators. In other words, when you get severe endothelial cell dysfunction from whether it's, um, you know, a lot of sugar or diabetics or whether it's a viral illness or, you know, a bacterial illness, uh, one thing that CoQ10 does, it's an NF-kappa B inhibitor. In other words, NF-kappa B is an inflammatory mediator that re it's a cytokine that, re that reacts to a, like the cytokine storm, which, which causes a lot of blood clotting in these uh, patients, you know, with COVID. But what CoQ10 does, it ameliorates. In other words, it, it, it tones down the inflammatory mediators. It's an NF-kappa B inhibitor. It, in, it inhibits interleukin-6, which is another inflammatory mediator. You know about C-reactive protein. In other words, it lowers C-reactive protein, which is another inflammatory mediator. So um, even in this day and age of COVID, um, you know, I find uh, a lot of comfort in my own heart knowing that CoQ10, you know, can be an antidote uh, to, to these factors as well. So um, viral pneumonias are dangerous, you know, whether it's influenza, SARS, COVID, uh, you know, any viral pneumonia is a dangerous pneumonia because, uh, again, antibiotics don't treat it. But now, you know, now there's a lot of stuff out there. You know, there's, there's antibody treatments, there's ivermectin, there's, there's, there's so many, there's, you know, hydroxychloroquine, there's so many things patients can take, um, you know. And again, like I mentioned before, I think vitamin D 
is, is one of the most important things in protecting our immune system going forward in, in this epidemic. Yeah, I love that. Um, before we get into some of the superfoods and things like that, I want to just touch in on um, the bioenergetic body. You know, in uh, my wife and I both train currently yoga teachers, and we do a lot of you know breath work and you know meditation, yoga, and whatnot. And uh, we're constantly educating people on the importance of you know autonomy, integrity, and you know self care through through you know you know whether it be grounding and 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 uh, and everything I just mentioned. What you've got such a beautiful perspective on, you know, just humanity and, and going into the, the, the heart space, you know, uh, of love and what, what role do you see as a cardiologist, uh, is there in this realm of bioenergetic, bioenergetic medicine in the, in the realm of, you know, whether it be meditation, yoga, or breath work or prayer, or how important is that for your patients that you work with for, for excellent Oh, it, it, it's vitally important. I mean, you, you've, you know, hit all the benchmarks. There's no doubt about it. I mean, uh, even yoga. I mean, yoga is really important because there's good data to show that it lowers blood pressure. It can even prevent atrial fibrillation. It's kind of interesting. I mean, there's some wow. good data on that. But one of the things about yoga, and I used to teach at Servananda, you know, the Yoga Institute. I, I would give lectures down there uh, for years. One of the things about yoga that yoga instructors tell their clients is, Whenever you have do a twist and the twist, the twist is un uncomfortable, well, you breathe into that twist, right? And when you breathe into that twist, now you're, you're, you're sort of balancing the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system and you're supporting heart rate variability. So you're creating all these, through the breath work, through the uncomfortableness, you, you're creating all these messages that are talking together in the body, you know, wh where you're calming the body down. You know, prayer is a form of meditation. And meditation does the same thing, whether it's a mantra meditation, you know, you know, you can say Hail Mary full of grace or the Lord is my shepherd or, you know, the Jewish shal shalom, or, you know, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. In other words, or you can use the Om, you know, where we, we, where the, you know, the, the yogis would do it. Even at Sarvananda, we, we would say the word Om. And by the way, Om has the same resonance, the same resonance uh, that grounding has. It's 7.8, 7.83 hertz. Think about that. When you say Om, that is resonance is the same as what you're taking in from mother earth. That is kind of interesting. That's, that's, that's really, really interesting. So, so basically, you know, all those aspects really work, you know, and I, I just feel that, um, you know, whenever you pray, whenever you laugh, uh, whenever you pet, pet a dog. And I think um, <laughs> one of the best things that I learned about recovery of a heart attack was coming home to a pet that gives you unconditional love. I remember speaking with Jim Lynch. He wrote The Broken Heart. He was a, a, a Maryland-based psychologist. And, and Jim, this is like 30 years ago, but he was, he was way ahead of the time. And um, uh, I remember as a heart specialist that when I had uh, people with heart attacks and if their spouses have expired or died before them and they had a heart attack and they went home to an empty house, uh, I saw them again uh, with another uh, heart attack or heart failure or a devastating arrhythmia. They came back. But if they went home to a non-judgmental spouse, right, a happy, a happy wife, right, or if they went home to uh, a non-empty house, you know, where there was activity in a house with animals or, 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 or maybe there wasn't a spouse, but if they came home to unconditional love, like from a dog, the data on this is amazing. These people who have had heart attacks that come home to an unconditionally loving animal, their incidence of readmission uh, to the hospital is 400% lower. <laughs> Think about that. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable data. So, you know, since I've had dogs myself for, for, for decades, when I used to see people in the office who were in their 70s and 80s, even 60s, who had lost their spouse and their children are out of the house or, you know, overseas and, you know, they were lonely. Nick, my, my doctor's prescription was adopt a pet. And I would say this, I would say, you know, go to a home and let the pet pick out you, I would say. Let the pet pick you. And if you and the pet resonate, if, you, if, you, if your heart flutters, if you smile, 
If you have a little bodily response to that pet picking you out, that's the pet for you. And I got to tell you, I've done this dozens and dozens of times and people would come back and thank me and hug me because, you know, coming home to a, uh, a house with a loving pet, giving you unconditional love, I believe uh, caused my patients to thrive over the years. So, uh, you know, that in itself is, is, is very, very important. Wow. What a beautiful message. And, and I mean, so timely for the world we're in right now where oh, there's gosh, so yeah. much talk about segregation, separation, all this stuff. And, you know, this is, this is really a call to, to community and, and love and support and, and, and these amazing creatures in our lives, these pets. <laughs> so let's, uh, that, that's, thank you so much for, for that answer. That's amazing. So you're, you're solving a problem with, with uh, the diet influence that's going, the modern diet influence in, in your website, vervana.com. Tell us a little bit about what's inspired you to, to get these amazing Italian home-cooked recipes out into the world and, and how you're solving the, part of this problem. Well, you know, like I said before, uh, heart specialists like myself are privy to diet. They, they realize how important diet is because it sets up the cascade for, uh, for heart disease. I mean, we know that. We live it. And, uh, um, you know, it, it's really important to eat a healthy diet. And, you know, even when I used to go to the Javits Center in New York City, they used to have the healthy food show there every year. And it would be acres and acres of healthy food. And I would walk down the organic sections and the natural sections. And I would look at these labels and I would find problems with organic food. And, and uh, you know, a lot of these foods had a lot of sugar, for example, or, you know, or, and, and, and it was stuff mixed in there. And, and organic was sort of like a, like a label, but it was a label in disguise. And it used to really bother me. And like, because I was a heart specialist, I decided to develop my own food products. I mean, I developed my own vitamins and minerals 30 years ago. I became very successful at it. And I, and I decided, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here. And because, you know, when you're in your late sixties, you don't want to develop a new business. That's like, that's sort of like insanity, you know? <laughs> so I, you know, I, I, I found a green facility. The only, there was only one green facility in the entire United States <laughs> that made, you know, sauces, tomato sauces and, and marinara sauces. So I met the chef. I, I was there and I met the chefs and I told them what I wanted to do. And I brought my grandfather's recipe from Sicily and blah, blah, blah. So we made sauce. And, uh, you know, it, it was a great sauce. Um, uh, and, and then they decided to do, you know, gluten-free pastas because, you know, a lot of people are gluten sensitive today. And I, I did a red lentil pasta, uh, which is a high protein pasta. And I was doing uh, uh, chickpea pastas. And I did them out of Italy. And the reason why I did these high protein pastas is because um, the semolina pastas have too many carbohydrates. So you're eating a lot of sugar. That's why when people were eating a lot of white semolina pasta, they would gain in weight. They were getting insulin resistant. So, but if you eat a high protein pasta, it's like eating a small sirloin steak or, or a hamburger, so to speak. You're not going to get the insulin response. And remember, you see, here's the problem, Nick. If you eat too many sugars and carbohydrates, and you have inadequate release of insulin, the sugar gets stored as fat. And then you, get, you keep gaining weight because you can't metabolize the, you know, the, the, the sugar calories that aren't metabolized by insulin. So it's a catch 22. So basically I developed these high protein pastas, the delicious. And then I uh, developed these uh, sauces from Sicily. I got these cherry tomato sauces. I, they're low in sugar, low in salt. I use all organic varietals, you know, onions and garlic. And I did my, my own recipes. I did taste tests. And uh, you know what one herb is really good for the heart? It's capsaicin. Uh, uh, you know, it's like a hot chili pepper. Okay. It's yeah. really because of the, the heat shock proteins that, it, that, that, in other words, the capsaicin is an anti-inflammatory, believe it or not, you know, in, uh, in the cardiovascular system. So, because I wanted to make medicinal pasta sauces, I, I worked with the Sicilians and I developed an abrabiata sauce with hot pepper in it, you know, from, you know, from red pepper, because I wanted to make a medicinal sauce. Uh, but I'll send you that sauce. It's kind of hot. You know, if you like hot, you'll love it. I do. You know what I mean? <laughs> you, you'll really like it. But like, um, you know, I developed dark chocolates because cocoa, cocoa flavonoids are amazing in lowering blood pressure, you know? Um, so I developed a, a dark chocolate, an organic, I found an organic chocolate, chocolate from Africa. I worked with that. I did this risotto from Tuscany. 
You know what the problem with rice is in America is, Nick? Are, are you privy to this information? I mean, I like rice. Rice is, I, I like the arsenic you know, level. Huh? The arsenic levels? Or? Arsenic. Absolutely. You hit the nail on the head. And the problem with the rice is in this country, they're loaded with arsenic. And we don't need arsenic. Oh, my God. I mean, you know, that's, a, that's a, not only a cardiac toxin, it's a neurotoxin. And it could be one of the reasons why we're seeing a lot of early Alzheimer's disease. But people eat a lot of rice. So I found a, a, um, a rice producer in the central highlands of Tuscany, Italy, <laughs> wow. where they have the lowest, and I mean the lowest arsenic in the world. You know what I mean? I mean, the arsenic is off the charts. In other words, it's, it, it can barely measure it. But, you know? but people got to realize there's arsenic in water. Even the water you drink yeah. at home has arsenic in it. Yeah. But like, and then, then, then I said to myself, wait a minute. I want to make a risotto, but I want to make a, a superfood risotto. So I cut the risotto with artichoke because artichoke, artichoke buds are loaded with, you know, silly myrin and, and bioflavonoids that are really good for the liver. And in this day and age of COVID, we need liver support. In other words, you know, our livers, you know, fat, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is off the charts in America. Fortunately, coenzyme Q10 is an antidote for that. We didn't mention that, you know, in the broadcast about that, but mm-hmm. non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is prevalent right now. And, uh, and it just makes sense that if you can take artichoke, and I love eating artichoke, by the way, you know, the heart of the artichoke, the, the leaves. I tend to eat artichokes at least once a week when I go to the grocery store. If they, if, they, if they're, you know, look good, I always buy them. But like, that's why I developed a risotto with artichoke was to protect the liver. So I call them superfoods. And, and the reason why I do this is because Again, I believe so strongly that the the way to prevent Alzheimer's disease, neurodegenerative disease, cancer, heart disease, you name it, is to eat healthy foods. And uh, and, and listen, I also believe in healthy vitamins and minerals. I mean, uh, because even the healthiest foods, you can't make up the deficit. I mean, there's lots of deficits, you know, and... uh, uh, and uh, I mentioned vitamin D. There's, there's unbelievable shortages of vitamin D because where do people get vitamin D? Well, if you eat a lot of canned seafood, you're going to get it. You know, if you, if you for, vitamin D fortified milk, you're going to get it. But you're not going to get vitamin D in very many foods. You know, so a lot of a lot of people put sunblock on. They don't absorb the vitamin D. They don't eat the foods, and all of a sudden, they got a vitamin D level, blood level in the basement. They catch a virus, and they're on a ventilator. It shouldn't be that way, you know? Yeah. That's why I think everybody should be taking at least two to 4,000 units of vitamin D a day. I mean, some, t- some days I take 10,000 units, you know, I probably overdo it because I live in Florida part of the time. I get a lot of sunlight, you know, I, I, I uh, uh, you know, a half hour of sunlight's not gonna hurt you. It really isn't gonna hurt you. Uh, after a half hour, you, you gotta be careful of the UV light. But, you know, I, I, I just feel that eating healthy is, is really, really important. and. And remember this, Nick, I, I studied this like crazy. Why are there hundred year old people in the Mediterranean basin? There are more hundred year old people in the Mediterranean basin than the entire world. doesn't matter. You live in Israel, Turkey, Libya, Southern France, Portugal, Italy. It doesn't matter. The common denominator is olive oil. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt about it. And there was a study that came out of a journal called Genomics about 10 years ago. And what it shows is that olive oil takes pro-inflammatory genes that we're all born with. So when the BioGenome Project was discovered in 1997 and three guys won the Nobel Prize, you know, we're learning about this now. That's why treating people is like alphabet soup, you know, AMPK and, and you know, uh, CAPK. I mean, it's unbelievable. It's like, oh, you know, all these different things that, you know, we're treating people. mTOR, you're hearing about autography, you're hearing about all these new scientific terms. You know, you really got to be up on it. And like what, what olive oil does is it takes pro-inflammatory genes and it reverses them back to a non-inflammatory state. Olive oil is also an mTOR inhibitor. I didn't know that. Hmm. And I just, wrote, I just wrote about that in my uh, textbook of cardiology. So there's lots of good things olive oil does. And that's probably one of the reasons why um, I developed olive oils in California, because you see, the problem with a lot of olive oils coming out of Western Europe is that many of them are cut with canola oil now. And uh, you, know, you can have 75% extra virgin olive oil and 25% canola, and the label will say 100% extra virgin. Uh, that's not a good thing. I, I don't like canola oil. Like I said, it's pro-inflammatory. 
But basically, if you get the California Growers certification on your olive oil, that means you've got to go through a chemical test and a taste test to make sure that your olive oil is 100% extra virgin. So all, our olive oils, and I should show you one. I'll show you one. Mm. This is uh, this is our, our olive oil. This is a Koranicki uh, organic, you know, extra virgin. But you see that little stamp of approval? Yeah, yeah. That's the stamp of approval that the olive oil has gone chemical analysis and taste analysis to show that it's 100% extra virgin. And you, you, we got to pay for that. There's no doubt about it. I mean, <laughs> I mean that adds cost to the production of that. But ha have I sent you my olive oils? Have you tried? No, the I haven't. I'm gonna, oh, I'll well, send you we'll some, order some. Our, uh, uh, extra virgins. I go through this like water. I mean, I drink this <laughs> stuff. I mean, you know, the pre-demed study, you're familiar with the pre-demed study, right? I don't know. Do oh, don't this know is great. I Actually, oh, your audience is going to love this. Yeah. There was a study done in, by Spanish researchers. In fact, I had them come to the, I, I called the head researcher from Spain after this was published in the medical literature. And I had them come to the American College of Nutrition. I'm on their board of directors. And I said, I want you to lecture to the Americans about your uh, research about olive oil. And what they did, Nick, is they took almost 8,000 people over a five year period. And they, and they had these people grouped into three groups. One, they got the low fat American Heart Association diet, you know, the very low fat diet. Mm -hmm. The second group followed the seven Aventus high fat, you know, nut diet. In other words, they had a couple of cupfuls of nuts a day and because they, they were because of the seven day Aventus and, you know, what they shown with nuts and, and, the, and the lower incidence of heart disease and Alzheimer's, et cetera. And then the third group was four tablespoons of olive oil a day, four tablespoons. That means you would go through a bottle like this in less than a month, right? Yeah. So anyway, um, when they looked at the data after about five years, they found that the olive oil group and the nut group had a 30% reduction in death, heart disease, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes. It was unbelievable. Oh, I mean, yeah. in fact, I have the data. I have the data right here in my book, in my book right now. I mean, I, I just thought it was just incredible. I mean, the, um, the, the diet showed that the reduction was so widespread. It improved type 2 diabetes. It lowered blood pressure. Uh, serum lipids went down. Uh, it reduced inflammation. Uh, it reduced coronary heart disease, CVA, and, and heart attack. And again, it was it was most likely due to the constituents of the of the olive oil. Wow. And um, in my new book in, that I'm publishing as the editor of this cardiology text, I really went to depth with olive oil. I talked about the oleopurine, the hydroxy tyrosol, you know, all the bioflavonoids uh, in this secret sauce uh, of the Mediterranean diet. But I'll tell you, that's why I feel that the Mediterranean diet and with olive oil as a secret sauce is really the best diet in the world today. Wow, that's amazing. Let me just think that, you know, we can add that to a prescription list for people who want to prevent uh, any sort of viral long COVID. You just, more olive oil could be part of that recipe. <laughs> well, you know, olive oil, again, it has so, such potent anti, you know, somebody should look at that. That's kind of yeah, interesting, that's, you know? Yeah. See, the problem with some of the stuff coming out of Europe is that I believe there's a connection between um, electromagnetics uh, 5G, for example, and um, weakening, um, you know, the uh, architecture of the lung. Uh, I, you know, people have uh, discussed this. I mean, brighter researchers, I mean, way brighter than me have published on this stuff. And like, um, it's almost like the perfect storm. So if you have a lot of high technology 5G, and you get exposed to the virus at the same time, they share the same frequencies, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I think we've seen a lot of hemorrhage into the lungs. So if you look at Spain, uh, Northern Italy, Switzerland, oh my God, Switzerland. Remember how Switzerland used to be neutral in all the wars because they had all yeah. the mountains and everything and blah, blah, blah. Well, now Switzerland is loaded with 5G. And um, there's, there's a lot of uh, illness going on, and unexplained illness going on in Switzerland right now. And, and again, the reason why I'm privy to this information is I, I just know a lot of you know, international scientists and, and physicians that share this information with me. It's not like I'm an expert on, on the Swiss. It's just, you know, they, they just tell me about it. 
But basically, you know, whether it's Wuhan, Spain, Northern Italy, Switzerland, Seattle, Washington, New York City, these are the 5G centers where the virus took off. So, you know, there could be a connection, uh, you know, and, and, and I think there is, and, and, and I believe the research will pan this out in the future. Well, that's just it. You know, I think, you know, cholesterol is a great example that, you know, this, this is the bad thing. And, you know, we have to stop the, the expression of this in the body, you know, fat's bad, you know, the, we've been through so many different iterations of what's, what's, what's okay, what's healthy, what's not. And I, and I do feel like this is just sort of another collective understanding that, that our electromagnetics are having a, a significant impact on the physiology of our body. And it's just a matter of time for most of us to catch up with, uh, with the data that's there and, and, and to tease out like what's, what's legitimate data, what's not. And so, you know, time will tell absolutely. And, you know, just, just to speak to everything that you've been sharing today, you're not, you're not talking about just one thing. It's, yeah, it's all yeah, you it's know, the perfect storm, right? Yeah. And, and things always change, Nick. Uh, yeah. I remember when I was a, a surgical assistant, when I was a fourth year medical student at Albany Medical College, I was operating uh, with a surgeon and it was peptic ulcer and we were cutting the vagus nerve. Wow. <laughs> that was a treatment for peptic ulcer when I was in medical school. And now 15, 20 years later, we found out it was a protozoa that causes ulcer. You know what I mean? <laughs> Ilial bacteria, right? You know, the Australians showed that, you know? Yeah. So things change. And like this whole thing about this cholesterol revolution that may change. Let me say one thing about cholesterol. One of the worst things in children is MRSA staph, you know, methicillin resistant staphylococci and bacteria, bacteria. We don't have the antidote for that. In other words, if, if you get this virulent staphylococcus, it can kill you. You know, it can literally kill you because we don't have the, the drugs that can, can combat it. Kind of an interesting situation. When children got it, the children with the higher cholesterols survived. Wow. Think about that. Think about that. See, that's what I mean. I, I mean, like, we can't kill a natural nutrient in a body because it's elevated, you know? Um, so I think the circle will come around just how we thought ulcers were caused by, you know, an overactive vagus nerve and emotional, no, look, emotional distress can cause anything in the body, but cutting the vagus nerve, I think was dinosaur medicine. So, right. <laughs> you know, we might do the same thing with cholesterol in the next 10 to 20 years. I mean, I, I don't know, but uh, this I do know for your listeners because we don't want to confuse them. The less sugar you put into your body, the better, the better. And look, if you're going to take in sugar, just take in sugar with a lot of polyphenol activity, like a very dark chocolate, greater than 70%, something like that. And, uh, you know, don't eat the whole bar. But, you know, one thing good about dark chocolate, if you have a sweet tooth, is that a couple of squares is all you really need because it has such polyphenol activity and it has that sweetness to it where you don't need a lot of it. It's not like eating a white chocolate bar or, her or, or like a... Uh, a Hershey bar where you want to eat the whole thing because again, it's sugar. The dark chocolate has the antidote, the polyphenol antidote to that sugar craving. So, you know, I, I, I think when it comes to chocolate, yeah, less is more, but dark chocolate is the way to go. You know, mm -hmm. that's amazing. Um, I want to respect your time, Dr. Sinatra. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you today. Um, we always like to, to leave with a question um, for, you know, for uh, the, the interviewee and, and, you know, I guess where we want to, where do we want to leave people, you know, going forward? Where, where do we want to, you know, leave people from a place of um, acceptance, a place of healing and um, where we want to basically move forward in our, in our life path. And so if, if this was your, your last day on the planet, what would you, what was the message that you want to leave for your family, for the people you work with, your, your patients, What's that, what's that final message? I would, I would say that the most important thing in this critical day and age that we're living in right now um, is vigilance, uh, where people are waiting for the other shoe to drop. And that creates cortisol elevation, uh, noradrenaline and adrenaline. Uh, that can wreak havoc with the body. I mean, we're seeing higher blood pressures, more cardiac arrhythmias, more suicides, more this, more that, more loneliness, more depression. And a lot of it is related to COVID-19. The antidote is simple. It's love. 
give fellow human beings the love they need. Um, you know, don't be critical. Um, uh, if you have a withhold, forget it. Um, if there's somebody you detest, forgive them. Um, just um, put out the unconditional love uh, because love is the greatest healer of all time. And the reason why I say that is when I wrote the book, Health Revelations from Heaven and Earth, it was my last book uh, about five or six years ago. And when I met Tommy Rosa, who went from, from heaven and back, I don't know if you read that book, Nick, but no. uh, you know, Tommy was run over by a car and uh, he was dead and uh, his body went over. He went through the tunnel of light. He went into heaven. Uh, oh my gosh. He, he, uh, he met religious figures. He saw his deceased father, his grandmother. Um, he describes the uh, essence of heaven, the, the smells, the beauty, the tranquility, uh, you know, the passage of light. And you got to realize as a heart specialist, I resurrected lots of people from sudden death in the cath lab and cardiac emergencies. And a lot of people told me about life after death experiences. So I was privy to Tommy's in depth, really prolonged life after death experience. I mean, I had people telling me they were floating on the ceiling and they saw me trying to save them and they were rooting for me. And I mean, I had, uh, you wouldn't believe all the stories that I've heard, right? Wow. But like, one thing that I learned from Tommy is that we're all going to a better place. And um, and the essence of health is really unconditional love. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and that's what Christ preached, um, is, is unconditional love. So like, um, I, I think the message that I want to give, you know, your listeners is to love your fellow man. And, um, you know, hug people. If you don't want to hug them, give them the elbow. But give them a message from your heart. In other words, just, you know, you know, put that person in your heart and send them a message of appreciation. By the way, that really works. I mean, that's, that's uh, uh, you know, you can just send, even send a person far away and just, just think about them for a second. And you're a meditator. I mean, you know this better than anybody. Just think about them, you know, place them in your heart and uh, do a little heart math with them and, uh, you know, send out good vibrations and, and, and those vibrations, I, I believe, will travel thousands of miles where, you know, lots of people unconsciously can, can take it in. So that would be my message to your listeners. That's a beautiful and timely message. Thank you so much, Dr. Sinatra. That, that was absolutely incredible. Yeah, thank you. Right, thank you, Nick. This was great. And uh, I hope your listeners, you know, get something out of the show. Oh, for sure they will. Yeah. Look forward to the olive oil too. <laughs> All right. Send me your address. I'll send you some of my uh, abriata sauce, some of my marinara. Uh, I can't send you the dark chocolate yet because it's summertime. I got to wait till summer. All right. Over. I'm worried about it melting in the mail. You know what I mean? <laughs> can't have that. That'd be disastrous. All right, Nick. Yeah, bye bye. So we'll much. see. This bye -bye. was fun. Bye -bye. All right. Bye bye.